started. Good morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Janet Lawton. I direct the Writing Center at AU. Um, I also teach in the Department of Literature. Um, the Writing Center is sponsored by the Department of Literature and CAS. Uh, however, it's now located in the library. Um, we are part of the library's research commons. Um, and we've only been there for a year, but are already seeing even more uh, people coming to, to uh, see the Writing Center. Um, and we've actually been on campus for um, almost 25 years, but this is the first time that we have been part of the Ann Farron Conference. So we're really excited to be here, and um, hope, we hope to, um, begin and continue a dialogue with you who are faculty um, because we have a lot to share and um, we're always eager to hear from you individually of course and um, work with your students and uh, uh, talk about uh, your assignments informally but today we're going to formalize it a bit um, and uh, sort of offer you um, some of the insights that um, come from working in the Writing Center. Uh, with me today are three of our writing consultants. Um, writing Center consultants uh, uh, get to look behind the scenes and um, see the student's eye view of your assignments. Um, and we think it's very productive and as a scholar myself, a scholar of teaching and learning, I, I assure you it's um, breathtakingly interesting to see how students interpret assignments. Um, the assignments that we think are, you know, sterling and <laughs> exemplary turn out to be a little bit fuzzy um, sometimes. Um, and uh, my colleagues here have um, a wonderful uh, ways to um, walk you through that and um, have done research uh, kind of investigating why that happens, why um, what we say is not what they hear in far, as far as assignments go and how assignments get lost in translation. Um, these consul writing consultants um, undergo a 10-hour course of study to become writing consultants in which they read the scholarship uh, on teaching, learning, writing, um, and also um, have uh, regular meetings throughout the semester in which they deepen their knowledge. Um, so uh, they study the kind of research that they're going to share with you today, but also writing consulting itself is a kind of research. It's, it's, um, gives uh, gives us so much uh, understanding and insight into the way that students learn. So we're really excited to be here and share with you, and we will have plenty of time uh, at the end to ask for your questions and also ask you your uh, perspectives <coughs> on the assignment uh, question. Uh, with me today are Madison Chapman, who's a senior lit major um, in her uh, last uh, and third semester uh, as a writing consultant. Uh, Veronica Garrison Joyner, who's uh, just completed her first semester at AU in the MA program and in the lit department and in the writing center. And finally, Hannah Mongol, who's our experienced one. Um, she uh, is in her second year uh, as a writing consultant and as an MFA student in the lit department. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Veronica. Good morning, everyone. Um, do you want to sit down? Or? Yeah, I think I'll sit down. <laughs> I'm 
so used to doing this and behind some sort of podium type business, but this is nice. Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about what happens when students misinterpret assignments. So as a writing consultant, I see students when they're trying to figure out what they're going to do next with their assignment. And very often they seem a little tentative, a little confused about what's going on there. And this is kind of how I imagine it occurred. So Professor A gives an assignment and asks students to analyze the text, meaning separate the readings or the information into separate or constituent parts and examine it critically. Well, Bobby sees that and says, analyze the text? What does that even mean? Okay, I'm going to figure out what, what I think she means and explain it, adding a bit of my own commentary. Well, what we understand is that um, when a question is not clear, it becomes a student's responsibility to construct a clear question and then answer it. Uh, Ed White gives a lot of information about how students interpret assignments in his book, Assigning, Responding, Evaluating, A Writing Teacher's Guide. <laughs> Let's look at another example. <laughs> Professor B assigns uh, a writing where she asks that students synthesize the ideas discussed in these texts. She wants them to combine or bring together different ideas or parts of ideas. Derek <laughs> sees synthesize and doesn't quite understand what she means by that, gets overwhelmed and says, you want me to write one essay about everything we've ever talked about in class? <laughs> um, okay, you asked for it. <laughs> Often, uh, when students don't really understand what they're expected to do, they get overwhelmed. And we see this in the Writing Center all the time, uh, where they look at a, at a question and know that they're supposed to bring together different ideas, but they don't really know how many ideas they're supposed to bring together or what to do with it. And they wind up overanalyzing the questions and overthinking the whole assignment and skipping the part that you really want them to focus on. And finally, we have Professor C, who asks students to discuss one of the following issues in, a, let's say, a writing exam. Uh, he wants them to explain or consider by argument or comment and to explore and evaluate possible <coughs> solutions to an issue or a problem or a question. Susie gets really excited at the word discuss and says, great, I just have to summarize all of this stuff. And that's what she's going to do. She's just going to write it all down and hope that some of it is something that you want. We have other examples of misinterpretation. A professor asks students to explain or render something ex understandable, make it plain, and the students here summarize. Professors say compare and contrast, asking students to look at and evaluate the similarities and the differences between text or ideas. And they say summarize. Twice. We, okay, I can do this. <laughs> and what we find is that the problem is not that teachers or students don't understand what these terms mean. Very often the fact is that these terms have no fixed meaning and can mean whatever the teacher expects them to mean. And you have a very clear idea of what you mean when you say analyze. And some students have a very clear idea of what they mean when they see analyze. And Deborah Butler and Sylvie Cartier have written <laughs> a wonderful essay called Promoting Effective Task Interpretation as an Important Work Habit, a Key to Successful Teaching and Learning. And they've told us that research shows students construct conceptions about academic expectations that don't always match those of their teachers. We just don't think always in the same way. So why, why don't, why don't they understand what analyze means the way that you understand the way analyze, what analyze means? And Butler and Cartier give three reasons for that. Uh, the first is a lack of metacognitive knowledge regarding assignment expectation. Basically, in their academic experience, they have not encountered this assignment enough to know what the question means, what they're being asked for. It just hasn't happened in their academic experience. Um, a second reason, which is kind of compounded onto a lack of metacognitive knowledge, is a lack of effective strategies for interpreting assignments. 
So maybe I don't know what analyze means or I have a different idea of what analyze means and I haven't learned how to go find out what you mean. How to look in the book and, and look for context into what you're really asking me for uh, as a student. And these two things kind of compound the issue. Now a third reason, which is kind of out of a professor's control, is a student's failure to actively seek understanding before they start on the assignment. So they may not know beforehand what it means to really synthesize information. And they may not also know how to go about seeking that information. But even then, sometimes students just don't even try. Sometimes they wait until the last minute <laughs> and say, oh, it's two days before this assignment is due and I don't really understand what she means. It's too late to figure it out now. I'm just gonna go with it. I'm gonna go with my understanding and then Sometimes you get an essay that doesn't match what you were asking for. So Butler and Cartier go on to explain that unfortunately, um, sometimes the tasks that students are given in school, like in early years of school, inadvertently reinforce unproductive task interpretations. Um, these then feed into a student's construction of unproductive metacognitive knowledge or misconceptions about the task that they're being asked to do, or both. <laughs> um, an example that they use um, has to do with like high school. So in high school, the emphasis is really on learning the information. It's on taking it in, taking it in, and taking it in. In college, we kind of switch the focus to applying that information and participating in a conversation about it so that you can be useful in the future, so that all this information isn't just sitting in your head waiting for whatever. You're actually using it. Um, that's a switch in focus that's sometimes difficult for students to get a hold of, and it's part of the transition process into college. Um, upon entering college, these students are just, they're unprepared to analyze the information correctly. Especially here, we have a large international student population. Uh, we have students that come from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different academic experiences and very often those experiences will contribute to their misconceptions about your objectives or the criteria or the actions they need to take to fulfill an assignment the way it's been assigned. Uh, many of these students, they just require a re-education in the interpretation and the completion of assignments. And um, with that, I will hand you over to my colleague, Paula. Hi, everyone. Um, so I did a lot of research at the Writing Center, um, and I'm gonna sort of share it with you now. I have a little introduction, and then I have some infographs to show you a little bit more about what I'm talking about in images. Um, so both in my own experience as a student and as a writing tutor, it can be very intimidating to lack fluency in the language with which a specific community communicates. Students, particularly new students, may feel inadequate if they fail to understand all of the parameters of an assignment sheet, especially if they are already feeling lost in classroom discussion. Placing blame for this language gap on either the students or the faculty, however, does not solve anything. Actually, I believe that opening a conversation about the different levels or languages used helps everyone involved by reminding faculty that this discourse wasn't always second nature and encouraging students to move towards fluency by engaging with the new language. The point is to emphasize that the conversation they are joining is not static and unobtainable, but a recursive dialogue that depends on the addition of new voices. As writing consultants, my colleagues and I often play an intermediary role between students and faculty. The fact that we too are students and work outside of the classroom's more formal hierarchy, hierarchical stratification, and we aren't grading their papers, allows for a kind of discourse that falls somewhere in the middle of academic and colloquial. For the purpose of examining possible lapses in communication between students and faculty, when it comes to designing and interpreting writing assignments, I directed my research to the Writing Center's intake forms, the forms students fill out when they come in for a session. Um, so this graph here shows um, some of the numbers that we pulled from the last semester, so that's fall 2014. Uh, we had about 1,098 total appointments, um, and then 
the uh, next two levels you can see are um, uh, first time students to the Writing Center and returning students to the Writing Center, and that stays about 50-50. Um, of those uh, almost 1,100 appointments, um, almost 900 of them were undergraduates. Um, that's the vast majority of our uh, clientele. And then of those undergrad students, 361 came in with specifically a paper for the college writing program that they wanted to work on. Uh, what the numbers mean in terms of what I will be discussing today is that out of those 1,098 appointments, I pulled 157 in which the consultant specifically referenced issues with understanding the assignment. From those 157, the students listed 254 total concerns. They often listed multiple um, expectations for the session, um, listed in 16 generalized categories that I'll go over. And out of that, 72, or almost one third of those student concerns were about the assignments. So all of these are um, cases where the consultant noted that it was a concern with the assignment, um, but almost one third of those were also times when the student noted. Um, so both first time and returning visitors to the Writing Center fill out a form before each appointment. The form asks them to fill in, among other things, their concerns with the paper, and their expectations for the session. After the 45 minute meeting, the students <coughs> rate their satisfaction and the consultants write their own confidential notes. These notes are meant to track progress, report any issues, provide accountability for our services, and help other consultants with what to expect if the student returns. For this presentation, I read through hundreds and hundreds of these forms looking for each instance that interpreting assignments came up in the notes. I was looking for inconsistencies and consistencies, especially with the language and the way that students and consultants described the, particular, the potential writing issues that emerge at the college level. Um, so this graph up here um, shows the 16 generalized categories um, and breaks down a little bit of the particularities within those, um, within those categories. Um, you can see that assignment is the largest category by far, um, followed, by, uh, oops, followed by not confident, which uh, we came to see uh, is very a similar category. So one thing that stood out when I looked at the student comments was that they seemed to list or select concerns with some level of haphazardness. Revision or editing, which usually means fixing things in general, making my paper better, um, came up a lot. But the big hitters, such as brainstorming, getting started, thesis, taking a position, making a claim, organization, structure, or assignment, were all identified by consultants as stemming from problems with interpreting the assignment. Uh, under assignment, I just broke down a little bit of what we were including um, as far as what students were saying. Um, making sure that they were meeting their professor's expectations was a big way that they, um, that they expressed that. Um, making, making sure I hit all the points. Um, complying with the prompt. Uh, or understanding the assignment or requirements. And uh, I just wanted to specifically note that a lot of students uh, refer to these uh, in cases of literature reviews, annotated bibliographies, abstracts, combining narrative and research and transitioning or incorporating research. Um, those are specific areas that I noted um, students were uh, dealing with issues of, with interpreting their assignments. Um, so I have a couple examples of uh, what the students would say and then what the writing consultants would say in their notes following the session. Um, so when a student says um, structuring essay, uh, the consultant writ wrote after that, uh, veered off topic, prompt asked for discussion of pros and cons, student heading towards a comparison of class hierarchies, recommended working on thesis together to help with outlining and staying on topic with the prompt. Um, another example, the student said, taking a position, forming a thesis. The consultant wrote, asked to write a personal essay, but the student was unsure how to comply with professor's expectation that she balance subjective and objective details. When the student wrote, revamping my essay for a higher grade, 
the consultant wrote student misunderstood assignment that asked him to view a topic through a lens or theoretical school and instead focused on the lens itself. I'm actually very surprised that the professor hadn't realized that this was a source of concern. So this specifically references the sort of conversation that we get to see a student having with us um, in the sort of lower pressure environment where they're not afraid to say, I don't get it. Um, the student check marked assignment, organizing, developing, citing, polishing, and revision. So down the list. The consultant wrote, problems stemmed not from writing issues, but from understanding his assignment. I have no way of knowing how much his professor explained in class. The assignment is a lit review specific to the professor's instructions that were not really on the page the student showed me. I'm not sure why the student is so lost on the details of the assignment. Based only on the assignment sheet, however, the expect expectations are not very clear. Student has low confidence due to a low grade on a previous paper because he, of the same issue, he says. I think his problems come from a mixture of not understanding his assignments or the research process. Um, the next example, the student checkmarked assignment, organizing, and developing. And the consultant wrote, needed help understanding the essay assignment. It had a lot of steps, so we worked on creating a visual chart in order to outline with each of these topics. I think this, this one refers to what Ronnie, or Veronica, sorry, formal <laughs> occasion, what Veronica was saying about, um, there's so many questions on this assignment sheet. Do I need to answer all of these questions in my paper? And, and I think a lot of the times, what we think when we're writing assignments is, um, I'm helping them, I'm giving them a, a starting point for conversation. I'm asking these questions that'll lead them to research, uh, to seek answers and to seek synthesize, uh, or to seek to synthesize these questions. Um, and the student sees, I'm answering each of these questions, but not in the list. How do I do that? Um, so I have two more short examples. The student says, understand assignment and expectations. And the consultant wrote, smart but unorganized, probably from a lack of experience or metacognitive skills, um, and difficulty discerning the professor's assignments. Uh, and here's the last one. The student said, I need to restructure my essay. And the consultant wrote, she had questions about the structure because she had gone through and added sources after writing the paper. She was worried about choppiness, but I was more concerned with her grasp of the assignment, a research paper. Um, so this just, uh, I wanted to show you some examples of the different languages or language that students and consultants use because I find that we've often, we often operate in a sort of middle ground um, between what using more of the language of the academy, more of the language that the professors are using to explain the same problems that the students are trying to tell us. Um, as you can see, these pairs run the gamut from students misunderstanding assignment terminology to being overwhelmed by assignment expectations to failing to adhere to the assignment at all. Again, my goal is not to prescribe solutions or locate blame, but to raise awareness that sometimes the words we use, even throw around words like thesis or compare, can sound like a foreign language to new students. One problem that the, is that these are concept words, common in our disciplines, but used in slightly varied ways that may need translation to students new to the discipline. The combination of new vocabulary, abstract concepts, and more involved research expectations brings many students to the writing center. Although they may not know exactly what to call their writing issues, Coming to the Writing Center can be a great step towards familiarizing themselves, them, themselves with the mechanics of the assignment and design in a low pressure environment. The vast majority of students list faculty on the where did you hear about us section. We're glad to have you enlist our help in translating disciplinary language, but we also encourage faculty to be aware of how students are reading your assignments. By engaging them in a conversation about the language used in the disciplines, you are keeping discourse alive and active. This kind of discussion helps students gain fluency, helps faculty remember and reevaluate their own definition, and also nurtures the idea that student voices are a valuable and authoritative dynamic in this conversation we keep talking about. And with that, I will move on to Matt. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about scholarship by writing center directors because I wanted to do a survey of not only what we're seeing as consultants in the writing center very consistently, but to see what writing centers across the country are experiencing in terms of assignment misinterpretation. Yeah, right. So I, just a reminder to go off of what Hannah already mentioned is that we are not proofreaders. We don't just fix little things that our big role is as communication mediators. We help students to identify and define keywords and assignments in order to facilitate their own understanding of expectations. We want to make sure that when we are giving advice to students on how to interpret assignments, that we're trying to give them the tools to better understand the next assignment sheet that they see in front of them. Uh, and as Hannah talked a lot about, we really have this unique position in between professors and students. They feel like that they can open up to us because we are their peers and we go through the same things as them every week. And that, I think, so part of our work is technical in terms of writing, but part of my work I see as sort of a psychological thing in terms of relating to the other students. So I started looking at the scholarship, and we are not alone in consistently seeing students whose main concerns stem from these interpretation issues. Uh, the writing center director at Winthrop University says that you, understandably students believe the purpose of all their writing is transactive. They expect the teacher to want information. As a result, they confuse the teacher's desire for a detail with a need for facts. And that kind of goes back to what Ronnie was saying about some of the ingrained uh, tools that students get from high school sometimes with writing, that they see it as a formula. Sometimes they're taught, you know, it's the five paragraph essay, or if they're working towards standardized testing, it becomes sort of regurgitating information and not as much learning to respond to different specific command terms. Uh, and a tutor at DePaul University writes that while often misunderstood by students, the assignment sheet is an important text within the university. It's important because it is written within the language of the academic Discourse community, the writing prompt is a genre that complicates the student's rhetorical situations from which they compose. And as a student myself, I don't think I really thought about the assignment sheet as a genre in and of itself until I started working at the Writing Center and seeing so many different assignment sheets across so many disciplines and realizing how critical that one little piece of paper that we get every few weeks is to our success in academia at large, regardless of whatever career path we need to, we want to end up on, we need to be able to grasp this genre as students in order to succeed. Okay. Uh, and then this is another quote, is apparent that some students increasingly hate and fear the writing process itself. Teaching writing as a process is supposed to ease the student's anxiety, but we have to be aware that the process can be pressed only so far before we bring about a situation of diminishing returns. So as a literature major and a student who really loves writing, I think that's really sad that students can fall into this feeling of fear and frustration with the process when they should be starting to develop their own interest and focus as they find a major and get excited about something. If they can't <coughs> write about what they get excited about, that's kind of a dangerous thing as they go on with their finishing up capstones and bigger projects. So this does lead to a cycle of confusion. They misinterpret assignments, they write a paper, they revise it, they bring it to the writing center and say, I don't understand the assignment, and then we're suddenly seeing revisions of revised papers, and that's where it starts to get concerning. So I decided to look at writing center scholarship on not only what goes wrong in confirming what we see, but also what can we do about it? What can we do about it from a consultant angle and also from the professor, your side? So, Writing Center scholars are professors too. I found this really great article by Allison Rank and Heather Poole, who are poli-sci professors and former general writing center directors. So they over um, saw writing centers that uh, brought in students across disciplines. And now that they work at a writing center for graduate students of political science, which is more specific. But they identified some consistent problems that they've seen over the years with student assignment interpretation issues and then they go through and offer suggested methods of improvement for both professors and writing center staff members. So this is a very recent ar article too. Some of the other ones I quoted are from the past couple of years, but this is from this past summer. Uh, and I thought that was interesting that as we look to propose this um, presentation back in August, that this article came out just a month ago. So this is a very relevant uh, concern for writing center directors across the country right now. Uh, so one of the biggest issues that we see is wording. 
uh, we often talk to students about how they aren't quite grasping the meaning of command words, like uh, all the ones that they just went through of analyze, synthesize, discuss, explain. So uh, Rank and Poole write in their article that we argue that the intent, structure, and wording of a prompt all help promote or impede student mm -hmm. learning. So that wording is really critical to getting students to get on the right track. So what do we do to address these issues? Uh, engaging with assignment sheets is big. We talk to students about really physically engaging with the sheet itself. When they get handed the assignment sheet in class, I recommend that students right then and there, as the professor's explaining, start physically underlining, highlighting command words. I was a TA last semester, and I did a whole presentation to my students about how important it is to not just take it and stuff it in your bag and run out in the last five minutes of class, but to really take the time in that moment when the professor is going over things and ask, uh, asking students if they have questions to engage with the piece of paper itself. And then in the writing center, we also talk about relational knowledge, which is something that Poole and Rank discussed which is it can be helpful to refer to past assignments if this project is linked to previous work for a class. Now you as professors, as faculty, you always know that this specific project fits into a very specific plan for your course in general, but sometimes students think of everything as what do I need to finish by the next week? So when we pause in a session and get them to reframe this assignment in terms of the larger goals, the learning goals for the class, that can sometimes help them to focus on identifying the goal of the assignment in terms of the learning outcomes. And lastly, opening communication lines is very important. A big portion of the undergraduates that we see are first year students. And there's still that barrier of anxiety and fear that they feel like that when they come to their professor's office hours, they need to know everything about the course and it's a terrifying experience. And I think part of our job is to break down that barrier and say, no, they want to help you. They have those office hours and they want you to come visit and talk and discuss an assignment. And how critical those visits can be, not only for clearing up that one specific project, but also for building strong relationships between professors and students and for help, helping to clarify any issues with the class in general. So I, and even if the student is uncomfortable doing that, sometimes we'll talk to them about emails, and how to draft specific questions in terms of the prompt because we always have students bring in the assignment sheet. So if they are very nervous, we can sort of help guide them the steps towards better communication. Okay, so they give some suggestions, Rank and Pool, uh, back to their article, for how faculty specifically can address issues of interpretation. And they, in their article, have created a new set of guidelines that's based on yeah, and the adapted version of Bloom's taxonomy. So um, they tailor that for university assignment strategies, focusing on some of the wording issues that I talked about before, and also relational knowledge, tying the assignment very clearly back to what the students have already been learning. So they write, by receiving instruction on the expected format and logic of work in our discipline, students will be better equipped as both readers and writers of discipline-specific content. <laughs> to help students understand how these goals are different, instructors perhaps should also provide definitions of the command terms for their students. <laughs> As Hannah mentioned earlier, command terms for describe, analyze, that can actually differ in meaning across a discipline. So if you have a student, whether it's a gen ed class or not, if you have a student who may not be, this might be their first class in a new discipline, it's good to give them a glossary or an explanation of exactly what you mean because they may understand that term perfectly in another discipline and it may not be as easy to digest for them in the discipline of your specific course. And that I, my, it's my formatting there on the italics for format and logic because those are, sometimes we see students grasp the format correctly but not the logic of the assignment and vice versa. They can get one aspect of how they should be doing it and but not necessarily the why and how the assignment fits in with the class in general. Um, that one of their other suggestions was to structure the questions in terms of primary and secondary questions. And that's the, just which one of you, I don't remember, was talking about how there can be a long list of things. Yeah, both of you. <laughs> so sometimes on the assignment sheet you see a lot of listed secondary questions. And what they're recommending is that you put in the one key central question to address the main point of the assignment. So have that visually very clear that this is the main point, but then have the secondary questions that serve to direct students' focus to particular texts or concepts. So not necessarily do away with having listed extra questions to clarify what students could be thinking about, 
but if you point to specific uh, text from the class, part of what's been considered in that course already, that might help guide students past without making them feel overwhelmed by all the different questions that you're suggesting. Now, uh, we recognize that there's always going to be assignment sheet challenges because the, the format of the assignment sheet and content will reflect expectations specific to discipline. So there may be places where you really can't shift the assignment sheet or try to make it more clear because it's just very specific to what you need to get from your students for the learning outcomes of the class. So there might not be the, flex the flexibility there in changing the wording or question, stru question structure. Uh, and we have to remember that even with the right tools in terms of metacognitive learning and in terms of understanding the different glossary terms of command terms, students still may not get it. What we see weekly is students who put up emotional barriers when they find an assignment, a class or a professor too intimidating or frustrating. And sometimes we can work through that as writing center consultants and let them have their little rants or <laughs> and, and work through that and say, okay, now you've got that out, now let's try to focus on the assignment at hand. But sometimes students just can't break through that and the anxiety is too much and they just don't, they're not able to get it. But I think the important thing is that we just have these continued communication efforts. And we're really excited to be here as writing center consultants for the first time. Um, so we think that even with these challenges, it's productive to continue to think about to maintain these communication efforts between faculty, students, and writing center consultants. And as you can see from the brief survey of scholarship that we've been over in the presentation today, that this is a dialogue that we're having is just a small part of a critical ongoing discussion across the country about decoding the assignment sheet. Thank you. <laughs> All of this, of course, will be up on Blackboard, um, including the bibliographic <coughs> references. So if you want, you want to uh, pursue article? these these articles, um, uh, you can offer that. Um, and we have left time now for um, your questions to the panel. Um, any clarification that you want, or um, if you just have. Uh, questions about uh, uh, creating assignments, about working with students, um, uh, about assignments, um, please, please ask. Then um, they have uh, a question or two for you. Um, and also, we brought along uh, a couple of samples. We have, oh, 60 or 70 handouts um, that they use in sessions. Um, about all kinds of writing issues. Um, these two are um, specifically about assignments that ask for critical analysis because that's one term that students, you know, don't <laughs> don't have a really good grasp of. Um, this one is critical analysis across the curriculum. Um, the other one is critical analysis in the humanities. And um, I have some extra copies if if you'd like to take a look. Um, they show the kinds of questions that you might ask students, um, uh, the kinds of clarification that you might give um, when your assignment asks for critical analysis. Um, we also have Writing Center uh, bookmarks there if you want to uh, have the reference, the phone number and everything, um, they're there. So um, can, we'll just open for questions first of all. What does a student, if, if a student has an assignment and the assignment sheet asks the student, what do they think? What does the student interpret that word as? And what does the faculty interpret? I think it depends a lot on um, the rest of the wording on the assignment sheet. Uh, if it says uh, that this is also combining research, then you run into that problem of, well, how do I combine uh, what I think and what these other people think. And a lot of times, I spend a lot of time at the Writing Center like encouraging students that, no, you're supposed to join this conversation now. Um, just because they wrote it in a book doesn't mean that their opinion is you know, better than yours. You're supposed to be engaging with that. So when it asks you what you think, I actually tell them to think of it as an out loud, as an out loud conversation. The book is saying something to you, just like I'm saying something to you. And then 
what would you say in response if you were sitting across from this book at a table? Um, you know, would you have any questions? Hey, I didn't understand what you were saying in that paragraph. Then go into why didn't you understand what was going on in that paragraph? So I, I actually encourage them to think of it as an out loud actual conversation that's going on um, to sort of integrate them into the idea of in including their own voice. Their own voice can be asking a question of the text or it can be responding to the text. I do want to add on to that. Um, what I've seen with students especially is a tentativeness to really tell you what they think. Very often students and and we in the Writing Center are always telling them, no, tell them what you think. But they will very often say, do, do they really want what I think or do they want me to think what they think? And sometimes they really do need that extra encouragement in the classroom to say, your opinion is valid, even if it's not the same as mine. You know, they really worry about that. And especially with incorporating research, if their opinion, a big concern with students is, if my opinion is different than the professor's, do I need to back up my opinion with so much research that I prove myself to be right or will I fail? And that's a very, it's a, it's a line between giving my opinion and really being able to prove my opinion that students are trying to walk with and that. And paradoxically, I think it's some of the brightest students who often have the most anxiety about articulating their own opinion because they're so used to, ha the ones who want to spend the time to do the research for the research assignments and really make sure that they're doing the assignment to the best of their ability and they've proofread it and stuff, that they sort of freeze up, especially first year students who, when they're told, no, no, we just want to hear what you, you think specifically, when it becomes pure opinion, then I think some of those, the honor students there, I work with scholar students, that they really, that makes them more anxious than an assignment sheet with lots of guidelines for a number of sources or whatever. I wanted to follow up on that um, as well. In the in the psychological literature about education, I think there's a, a huge difference between whether what you've just been talking about, about what the student means or thinks you mean when you say what do you think, is something that can be easily fixed by a little bit better explanation, or whether it's in a deep way related to what they think the world is about. Um, and the student, and I remember being the student, um, the student who thinks that there's the real world, which is, you know, my, my normal world of thought and action, and then there's the school world. And in the school world, it's about telling back what has been said to you. And I remember thinking, <coughs> as an 11th or 12th grader even, um, and to some extent into college, that when someone said, give me a critical analysis of this novel, inwardly at what I was saying was, that's crazy. <laughs> because I'm not an expert. I'm not a faculty member. I'm not a published author. It, it, and worse, if it's a published article, then I'm supposed to give me your critic. Well, there, there must be some gain in this. I've got to figure out what it is. Because clearly, in, given my understanding of the world, they can't possibly mean what they say they mean. Um, and so the question is, how do you begin creating a world and assignment after assignment, probably course after course, that gradually gets the student to see what a faculty member usually means when they say, what do you think, and why the faculty member wants to know what the student thinks. Yeah, I think, I think that relates a lot to this idea of gaining fluency, because it's really hard to feel like you can join the conversation when you don't even understand the words that are being used in the conversation, um, which uh, is why we recommend and we work with students all the time on on just building that knowledge and making it a back and forth kind of thing where it's not that, um, it's not necessarily that there are these two different worlds and they're completely separate, but it can be very easy to feel that way when you operate fluently in this world and not so much in this world the same way that it is when you go to a foreign country and you realize I can only speak like a third grader and it makes you feel very self-conscious about your ability to contribute anything to that conversation. So I think that like building up that sort of uh, familiarity and just comfort in, in using the same terms and understanding them when you read and in using them yourself. And I don't think it's a, it's a turnkey kind of like you, you hit the switch and it works, but it's 
part of that thing that students are undergoing as they go through their college experience. And one thing that I noticed uh, during my research in the Writing Center was just even a difference in the way that writing consultants were talking about these sessions between very new consultants and consultants who had been there for a very long time or who had teaching experience. Um, there was a difference already in the language that those consultants were using as you could see them progressing through that sort of scale. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for framing assignments in a way that helps to address the timidity that students have. This is sort of related to this question about thinking and about engaging in the world. Timidity that students have to engage beyond how they perceive the grading process to work. So students want clear instruction about what they need to do in order to get the grade that they, that they want or expect. So have you seen assignments structured in a certain way that, that work to move students beyond that, or maybe the other way that work to sort of hold students into that structure? I think it depends a lot on faculty relationships with students there. If a student, and I mean, that's obviously a very hard thing for you to address on your end in terms of timidness, because a lot of that stems just from the anxiety of the intimidating place of the faculty member in relation to the student. Um, but I, I think I find that students, when they feel like a faculty member has asked them about assignment, well, I want to know what you liked or what, you know, what did you like about this a text that I'm asking you to analyze, and now take what you liked and apply that to the assignment sheet. And I think when I have students come in for brainstorming sessions, those are the most fun because I start from that place of asking them, well, you need, you're in college now, you, you tailor the assignment to what you found the most engaging because often there is room in those assignments that the, as assignments get more broad, that's often as they get more advanced. And I think that's when students have an opportunity to explore what interests them most. And by pointing that out, sometimes that's a just a reframing of how students understand assignments to begin with. And the going from that high school transactive standardized testing mode of thinking of I regurgitate what I what will get me the grade to validating students' opinions. So and I think like un ungraded assignments um, that contribute towards a paper um, definitely helps with that. Um, faculty, I've seen, I've seen students bring in assignments that um, are built on a series of ungraded assignments, maybe classroom writing assignments um, that sort of start the generation um, process going. Um, and, and it's sort of pushed towards that idea that it's not like a start stop thing. You don't um, pick up a book, you do your research, you put it down and that's the end, but that it's something that you know, you should be um, when you're driving in your car listening to the radio and you hear uh, the, the person on NPR say something, um, you can be drawing those connections and that that research isn't just something that starts and stops when you sit down at a desk or at the library, but uh, it's something that you're like always thinking about. And, and that, I think, a lot talks to what you were speaking about, like getting them excited about a specific topic. And you know, more advanced students, graduate students in particular, I know, um, when I'm writing a paper for one class, it ends up going into my other classes because I'm so excited about this one aspect that now I'm gonna look at how that applies to you know feminist theory and blah, 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 blah. But like, I, I will start, it just becomes everything about what I'm doing. I can't read a sentence in any book without thinking about how that relates to my topics, my, my things. And so I think that just like getting students excited about that in ways that aren't necessarily like the final paper um, is a good way to sort of start that. Yeah, just to um, piggyback off of what Hannah said, the ungraded assignments really help with that where the only grade is that you did it or not, like whether or not you did it, because that's when students kind of feel free to say what they want to say. Now, some of them will use that as an excuse to give you whatever they want to give you so they can get their grade. <laughs> okay, you know, you got, you got your apple. But um, <laughs> what, what I found as a student and as a writing consultant is that that's when students really give you their opinion and test the waters to see, okay, is my opinion going to be completely rejected or is it gonna be taken with some criticism? And that way they can kind of gauge how much of their opinion is really wanted in this essay. 
Because sometimes professors say, what do you think? And what you wind up giving them is what you think. And it maybe was a little bit too much of what you think. And you completely forgot about the information that you're supposed to be thinking about. <laughs> and so these assignments let students kind of gauge where that good middle ground is between giving you all of their opinion and incorporating what they're supposed to be learning as well. Yeah, on that note, revision opportunities and feedback on papers that like even sometimes going through one time as you know as the professor and then going through one time as the reader and asking those sort of questions like um, you know what did you mean here I'm interested in this can you can you look at something more with this that sort of question that engages a back and forth with them um, and giving them a chance to revise uh, I think lowers the pressure on doing it perfectly the first time and allows them to have a, a clear reader response like oh this is what the somebody who reads my my work is thinking and now I have a chance to respond to that to know oh it's not just that I did this wrong because if it's if it's not a revision opportunity it's wrong right wrong right what's the grade bye and if it's a revision opportunity they might use that as a time to to start looking at like okay well why is this wrong or right and and what can I do to fix that I had one more idea that helped me out significantly um, with the ungraded homework style assignments. If they say do a smaller draft or they do a smaller version of the bibliography, for instance, I'll say, okay, like you're getting a homework credit, but if this is a final project, if this was a major assignment, this is the letter grade you would get. And a lot of times, especially I do this often in September and January, students are shocked at how low some of the grades are. They kind of have come up, okay, if I actually want a B or I want that A on assignment, I need to do this much more work to get there. So they're not surprised and they're not arguing the grades when they finally get there. They kind of know what your expectations are right from the beginning of the semester. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one last question. You've been waiting, sorry. <laughs> but I also thought of something I do and I work with graduate students a lot and I have them talk about it what you're thinking of doing for your paper. And sometimes they'll help each other. They'll say, well, you can't do that unless you go and look at the literature on. And it gives them practice in using the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. and it, it's good to talk about the assignment in class and to start a discussion in class. But the other thing I was going to ask, and I see it all the time with grad students, it drives me crazy, no assignment sheet. Nothing written down you encounter that and what do you do? Um, go to office as a student. You go to office hours. I mean, I've I've gotten assignments that were a sentence in the syllabus, and that's it. That was the assignment, yeah. and that assignment was worth two thirds of the grade for the class. <laughs> so, um, that's a minority. It is. It doesn't <laughs> happen with everybody, but it does happen. And then when it happens, it's like, <laughs> what am I gonna do? And and you just go to office hours and you say, okay. I get that you want me to do this, should I, and then you ask questions, so should I do this? Or, okay, no, don't do that. Oh, well, what if I take about it this way? No, don't do that, do this part. Okay, now I get it. But that is when we wind up telling students, go to the office hours, because I cannot construct, as a writing consultant, I cannot construct an assignment sheet out of a sentence. And really, neither can the student. They have to go to the office hours, and we tell them, go to your professor and ask. Yeah. Is this we what you're can never, doing? Go ask them if you should do that. <laughs> we can, you know, we never ever say anything like, oh, you're, that's a really bad assignment sheet to, <laughs> to the students that come into the writing center. Um, but I think that, like, I definitely noted a lot of times like that where, where writing consultants would write <laughs> something like, maybe the professor said a lot more in class, but even I don't really know what to do with this assignment sheet. And if the student failed to take the proper notes, um, during that or didn't understand it or is lying to us, which is also a total um, possibility. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, then, you know, then it can be really difficult. And, and our, as Ronnie said, our, our method is usually just to turn it back around. I mean, we, we will send them back to you. Yeah. And third will be, and that's why office hours, you know, a lot of people say, oh, office hours are No, they're really important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's important is that students know what they are. Mm -hmm. I found a few years ago that I had a group of freshmen who just thought it was when the professor did his own filing. And that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they didn't know it's for them. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> that sort of, that just highlights the importance of like when you're going over your assignment sheet, explain 
things, like explain what you mean (laughs) by them, because it can just sometimes just slip through the cracks like that. Um, And And then a student's looking at all these hours and you put them on your list. Yeah, invite them, (laughs) invite them to your office. Um, Yeah. (laughs) We have a friend who has tea. Yeah. Uh, we love tea and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. I've got, uh, this is uh, maybe a puzzle that you can't solve, but I find like if I give a series of short writing assignments, um, things that are set up as a traditional essay, I get a certain kind of product from, and then I'll do something like, imagine you're a seventh century Buddhist living in Afghanistan. Write a letter to your parents about. <laughs> considering the conversion to Zoroastrianism, or whatever it is, right? And I get these genius <laughs> letters, and all of a sudden there are problems with comma splicing and, and tense, it all just dis- like magically disappears. And then I go, they go, and then after an essay, a regular essay, the, the next week, and it's back to like near literacy. And I can't <laughs> figure it out, right? What is it about? Because that is actually audience. validating the, their opinions, the, their own voice. And that's what we talk to students a lot about, is finding their own voice. And that's why verbal discussion, I think, between students, between students and faculty is so important, is that once they get those little acknowledgments of the things that interest them are worthy of writing about, and by giving them an assignment like that that allows room for creativity and allows room for them to say, oh, so that thing I was interested in, that one text we read about Buddhism, I can turn that into something in my own voice. That actually, I think, is a very empowering thing. Because all of your students know how to talk. They all know their own voice and they know how to use it, but then they think it's something else. It's a different voice. It's And all of a sudden, they no longer know how to get their ideas across. And I know that one of the most popular like tactics that we use at the Writing Center is Um, Okay, I don't really understand this sentence. Um, Why don't you turn it over and just tell me what your point is. Explain it in your own words and then we'll scribble furiously to copy it down while they're talking. Um, Because somehow in the space between I have this really great idea and the tip of my pen, it goes completely awry. Um, And they're trying to squeeze it into these words like indeed. And (laughs) they're trying to squeeze it into this format that they're reading that they're not fluent in yet. And so that's just sort of, um, I I just want to end with this final thing about like uh, ways to discuss this and make it something that that they are acting in the same role that we find ourselves in is this translating role, is that they, they should be encouraged to start moving in towards that towards that themselves, translating between the voice that they're comfortable in and the voice that they're learning um, to use and that we're expecting. And I think that a really, really good way to do this is to make discussion of the assignment sheet just as important as discussion of the texts. Um, Whether it's having them all write down a question, everyone write down a question so that it's not the one person raising their hand and saying, I don't get it and collecting them and then going over those, all all of the questions, um, because some of them could be totally dumb, like what is an office hour? Um, But some of them could be really important and everyone will benefit from it. So like using your text, like your assignment sheet and your syllabus as texts that are just as important as the text that you're reading in, in class and then also just as important as the text that your students are producing makes them start to see that this is all this this can all be something that they that they use their own voice in that they're that's all on the same language level because right now they're seeing it as like here and here and there's no middle ground right um i i think what i wanted to say is very close to what you wanted to say in that it is it's a different language Uh, like it seems like it's all english like we all we're we're all speaking english at least writing assignments uh, unless it's a french class but um (laughs) It's not the same language. What I, you know, they're they're code switching. You know, like I'm gonna write a a letter to a dignitary. Okay, I know what to do. I'm this person. They're taking on they're taking on a role. That's a completely different language than academic language for a five paragraph essay with a very strong thesis and evidentiary support. I mean, it's it's a difference, and it seems like it's all English, but really, they. They feel more comfortable, definitely, when you're taking on a role. That's acting, almost, right? Um, that's fun, and and you get more comfortable, and you can do that, and then you get into 
who, okay, I need to answer and evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of this position. Um, what? That it's just a the level of comfort that you have when you're at home talking to your friends and family about things. And when you get to school and have to talk to a, a, a professor about something, it's a completely different language. And if they don't feel like they can speak that language, they won't speak that language. They will speak some sort of mongrel version of it that doesn't really work because they're not confident in it. Um, but they're trying. As a teacher of writing teachers, um, I, I like the uh, old saw that none of us are born speaking academically. Um, thank you for coming and we thank our panelists for...